And I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 is where we'll be looking today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I thought this fits very well with our context that we've been in and in the book of Romans. And so Romans 5 is going to be a great, a great uh, uh, lead in and a great tie in to celebrating what Christ has done for us in the Supper. And uh, as I was thinking about this, you see my title, The Currency of Heaven. Well, uh, even as I got going here, I was thinking about different things and uh, currency and things like that. And uh, I, I even, uh, after I had gotten this sermon done, I even noted on the, on the computer that other sermons by other people have had this title. But nobody will have it like this one. Okay. <laughs> And, and in fact, just from what I gained from some of those titles, uh, they went a little bit different direction in, in some of that. But uh, when we think, about, we think about currency, a lot of times we might think of the haves and the have-nots, right? We see that idea thrown around a lot. And in fact, I hear there was a movie that even was titled that or something. But we were bombarded with, you know, contrasts of those that have and those that don't and this kind of thing. We see sad stories on the news about children not having enough food or we hear something about food service workers not making enough money, making less than minimum wage. You, see, you hear about the elderly uh, weighing the cost, should I eat or should I get my medicine and something like that. And then there's the sad, the sob stories about an ex-pro pro football player who has to declare bankruptcy. And then you hear about another pro football player I, I, that uh, he, he had to take a million less for his house because he got traded. And, uh, and I, I know that, that really tugs at your heart, right? Oh, <laughs> I see some of the smirks out here. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, then, then you have other professional athletes. Uh, Le LeBron James only makes $45 million in his salary. And, uh, well, but if you thought that was terrible, I mean, uh, you know, he's way short of Patrick Mahone's $59 million. You know, well, that's not counting endorsements, but anyway. Ted Turner owns 2 million, I think it's over 2 million acres of land in America. But poor, uh, poor Bill Gates only owns 242,000 acres. And his is all farmland, though. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, it's well known, it's well known that it's not much of what you make, it's what you keep or what you save, something like that, right? That's kind of a common saying and a common thing that people use. And I give you the example of, uh, of a guy named Ronald Reed, who was a janitor who, when he died, and, and when he died, he had $8 million to give away. $8 million to give away. And I want to challenge you, I want to challenge you today, how rich are you? And I'm not talking money. I want to talk about the spiritual richness that we have in Christ, and and uh, the and and when I say the the currency of heaven, I want you to think righteousness, because of our context that we've been in. I believe that that God that that the emphasis in our context, the emphasis of the first. These first several chapters in Romans are all about righteousness, how God has put the currency of heaven into our account. What is that currency? It's absolute righteousness has been put in our account, and that's really what we have when we talk about justification in our, in our first verse here. It is that God has made us right in his sight. God has deposited righteousness into our account. And so we're going to see that it, our verses are going to take us beyond that as a result of that justification. But let's look at these verses. Romans chapter 5, I want to read verses 1 and 2. Therefore, uh, you know therefores are for, are there for a reason, all right? And it goes back, it ties us into the previous context. Therefore, having been justified by faith, uh, King James goes, 
being justified. The, uh, the, some of the other translations go, since you were justified, something like that. But all of them, all of them are going to tell us that it's a completed idea. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom? Speaking about Christ. Also, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we're going to see, we're going to emphasize justification. Then we're going to see three things that we have as a result of that. And so as we think about this context, uh, the therefore ties us in here. And one of the things that, that we've been seeing, when that, that emphasis on righteousness being put to our account, uh, it, it ought to lend, lend itself to us sensing, uh, sensing ourselves to be secure. It ought to lend itself for us to think in terms of, of uh, being able to rest in God. And uh, I know several of you have, have backgrounds where there was not this type of security. In fact, from last week's message, a, a, a couple people commented, and, uh, and in fact, uh, Phyllis maybe gave me a comment today that it wasn't, for her growing up years, there was no security. There was no sense of, of, of confidence in God. But when you come to understand that this idea of justification, having been justified, the grammar puts, uh, the grammar is, uh, we have to say three words in English, whereas when, when we look, when I look at this word in the Greek, I see that this word justified and the word righteous are intermingled. In fact, that chart that I have on your, on your, uh, on your bulletin, and I have it up here as well, there are at least eight different words that, we, that all come from the same Greek, those, those five letters in Greek. And I know I'm not trying to teach you a Greek lesson. The way I first wrote this down, I wrote down, I said, I wish you could see. And I said, well, why don't I just show you? You know, I wish you could see that these, these Greek words that all start with the same five Greek letters. And there's over 200 times in the New Testament that you see this Greek, this, pre, this, this basic word used. And then and it, and it translates into justify and justification and righteousness and righteously and ri justly and, and several words like that. But these eight, at least eight different words, giving you 200 times in the New Testament. And so in our minds, I don't know if you always think of that. You see the word just, do you think righteous? Mm, maybe not. But in, in the Greek, I can't help it. I can't help but see, when I, when I see that Greek word, oh, this is all about righteousness. And so the word justification has this prefix in it, and this is, or this is the word, this is the root idea, and it ties in, it's talking about righteousness. And that's why, that's why my title is what it is, the currency of heaven, it is righteousness. And uh, by the way, this word for justified, I, yeah, I have it up there, don't I? This is the tenth time we've seen this word justified in Romans already. Ten times. It's used 40 times in the whole New Testament, but one quarter of them have already been, we've already seen them in the book of Romans in these first four and one verse. So having been justified and uh, we have peace with God, but... The idea, the idea of justified, and let me just de just emphasize again, it's the it's a judicial type term where the judge puts the hammer down and he says, "You're right in my sight. You are righteous." Well, how did that happen? You go back to chapter four, and we see that God imputed. God accounted some of those words that we looked at. God put righteousness in our account. And it's there. In fact, in fact, the, the grammar is so strong in this context here that it's, it's the idea that it is, a, it is a past 
finished transaction. Wouldn't you like to know if you put a dollar in the bank that it would be there forever? Now, we do trust our banking system, but you know what? You get in, I, there, are, there are certain situations where the IRS can tap your bank account. There's discussions that are out there even now about tapping retirement accounts and, you know, the government getting into those things. You know, nothing in this world is secure in the same manner. But righteousness in our account, in this context, it clearly tells us that it is a done deal. That righteousness is, is, is uh, it's put into our account and it's, and it's secure. And, it's, and what's our response? We are justified by faith. The moment we trust the Savior, that righteousness is in our account. And it's never to be moved. And I think that's what Phyllis told me this morning. She, she said, yeah, I had to get saved several times in that old church. You know what? If righteousness is permanently in your account, you got it. You got the currency that buys heaven. Because, and the moment you trust the Savior, you have righteousness in your account. You have eternal life. That's security. That's security. And it's, a secure, it's as secure as God. The God who cannot lie promised before the world began. So if you want to draw out an equation, you could say faith equals justification equals righteousness. And it's not works. It's not works like circumcision or obedience to the law like we looked at last, last week in Romans chapter 4. And if we get very, get very uh, you know, open about it, we'd have to say it's not about being good. It's not about praying. It's not about going forward to an, an altar call. It's not about getting baptized. It's not about taking communion. It's not about giving money. It's not about doing nursery. It's not about mowing the grass. It's not about cleaning the church. It's not about every other thing that, that often gets tangled up and we think about religion, what you eat, what you wear. I mean, you know, it's not about that. It's about God, and all glory needs to go to God for what God has done. When we get ourselves in the mix of that and think it's all, it's all about us, that's usually what we do. We're very self-focused. When it's all about us, there is no security. But when it's about God, it's easy. God's righteousness comes through faith alone. We saw that in chapter 3 and verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of law. We saw it in Romans 3.22. We saw it in, uh, we saw it in uh, Romans 4.5. Faith without works counts for righteousness. And to him who works not. Man, that's blunt, isn't it? To him who works not but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. That gives you security. God justifies the moment we believe. Trust means we're right in his sight. And that means we're fit for God's righteous heaven. Because of that, we have three things. Number one, peace with God. Because we've been justified, because we're secure in him, that he gave us his righteousness, we have peace with God. I don't know what you think about when you think about peace for the first thing. Uh, anybody think about no war? Yeah. No war. When there's absolute peace, there's no war. Uh, you know, we're in a kind of a very different, I know some of you lived through World War II, and you know how the whole, the whole nation was wrapped up in defeating the enemies, you know, east and west. 
but we were wrapped up in that whole thing. And, and uh, when peace came, you know, I, I probably should have put a picture of, uh, of that, that kiss that uh, anybody think of that, you know, when the, the ship came back and that, that fancy kiss that, uh, you know, the, the sailor and the, and the girl or whatever, you know, but the idea, the whole, the whole nation was so wrapped up in it. Now, now, what kind of war are we in? We're in a constant state of war today, a war of terror. We really are. I don't think some of those that were demonstrating on the college campuses understand that. But uh, anyway, I'm not going to go there because I'll get a little too riled up. But, but what's the closest thing most of us hear about the war on terror? We hear a little bit on the news, you know, when we, when we blast some uh, terrorist somewhere. And uh, maybe we hear just a little rumblings here and there on something else. But it's kind of distant, isn't it? Most of the time we don't think about it. Ever go, ever fly in an airplane recently? Why do we have TSA? Terror. No, T doesn't stand for terror, but, uh, but that's why it's that way. I, when I got on a, on a plane a couple of weeks ago, and there was a little girl going on some cheering thing or whatever with her mom, and, and she was all, why do we got to do this? Well, Barb and I had just gone to the Flight 93 Memorial in Pennsylvania on our way home, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it's a moving thing, and it reminds you that we are in a war on terror. And, uh, you know, this little girl, why are we, and I, I just said, well, because sometimes there's bad guys who want to do something, want to take the plane, you know. But we're, we are in this. It, it's there. But we have, we have peace because we have TSA. <laughs> in a sense, we have peace to get on a plane, all right? Is it perfect? Yeah, probably not. But we have peace. You know, when we were, everyone born was born an enemy of God. Everyone born is born against God. I hate to think of that, my little month-old granddaughter. You know, but she's, she was born as an enemy of God. Wow. She needs the peace of God. And I pray that one day she will trust the Savior and recognize that she's been justified and that she has peace with God. But that's the situation we're in. It's when, you know, that, that in reality... Because we're born sinners, we're all at war with God. And we're going to see in this chapter, we're going to see how God makes peace. But I don't want to get ahead of myself in that, in that context. But because we have this finished transaction of justification, we've been declared right by God, the righteous judge. We can be at peace with him. I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a courtroom. And, and uh, if you were ever there and the judge puts down the gavel and declares you guilty, there's a sinking feeling, even if it's a traffic ticket. There's a sinking feeling in that. But if the judge would put down the gavel and say, oh, you're right. You're absolutely righteous. What a peace that could come over us. I've talked to many people who the moment they trusted Jesus Christ, they sensed a sense of peace. They felt like a burden that was lifted and it was kind of a, not an aha moment, it was an aha moment. That there is a sense of peace that we can even, we can even feel. But we don't, we don't go on feelings. We go on the truth of the word of God, and the word of God says, you have it. You have peace with God. We are one of the haves, not the have-nots when it comes to spiritual. We are, and the first thing we have is peace with God. And that gives 
a sense of assurance, doesn't it? That's what God says. God says you're right in my sight. God says we're at peace. Ah. Number two, we have act, grace access. And it's very clear that he says that it comes through the Lord Jesus Christ, the same one, you know, he, the way he words it there, justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. What is he saying? It's through the gospel. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have peace with him. And then he says, we also have, we also have through him, we have grace access. It too is secure. Access into grace. And we could go, we could go a long time on the idea of, of what grace is. But again, just a reminder, grace is getting something you don't deserve. It's the gift of God that we don't deserve. It's given to us. And so we have grace access through Christ. Campbell's commentary, he's, he's just got a great statement here. He, he's dealing with the, the grammar, and he says, the language used here leaves no room for one to be separated from the grace, faith, and righteousness which God has provided. Romans chapter 8, 35 to 39. Oh, you go to Romans chapter 8. I can't wait to get there, but we got a lot of good stuff before then. But Romans chapter 8, the security that he gives in that context there, absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God. Why? Because we've been justified, because we're right in his sight, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. There is security in that. And so he says, into this grace in which we stand, we have a standing in grace. We have a position in grace where that favor is ours. That favor is ours through the righteous, faithful Christ. That act, and, and when we say access to grace, that access is unlimited. We have access into grace that is unlimited. Yeah, but I... Yesterday, I, it's unlimited. It's always there, 24-7. When we feel insecure, there's grace. When we doubt, there's grace. When we need forgiveness, and don't we? There's grace for that. When we're hurting, when we're discouraged, when we're feeling lonely, when we're feeling unloved. I know as I was just pondering those ideas, I, when I was a kid and we took a stand for the Lord, and then summer came. And you know what? I felt alone. Everybody was off doing their thing. We weren't gathering together anymore as these, this youth, this spontaneous youth group. And, uh, well, I guess nobody, you know. And I kind of threw up my hands and I kind of gave up on the Lord a little bit. When you're feeling unload, grace is still there. And then he goes on and he says, in, in, in verse 2 there, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice. I, I don't want to forget that, even though the focus is on the hope of the glory of God. And in addition to peace, in addition to grace, we have hope to boast in. Hope of God's glory. When we talk about boasting in this context, this is in direct contrast to Ephesians, what Ephesians 2, 9 ends with, lest anyone should boast. You know, it's, this isn't about personal human boasting in, well, I went to church today. Well, I, yeah, 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 you know. No, 
It's all the glory of God. Romans, as, as, as we think about this emphasis in Romans of the glory of God, I mentioned it, I think, in chapter 3 and verse 23. We often quote the first part of 323. For all have sinned and, co and come short of the glory of God. What's God's glory in this context? You know, I think it has to do with righteousness. Every one of us are short of God's righteous character. With the emphasis on righteousness in this, in this book of Romans, we're short of his righteousness. But now we've been declared right in his sight. In other words, we're not, we're not down here not measuring up. We're here measuring up to the righteousness of God. It's in our account. Do we always act like it? Of course not. But we have a hope for eternity because of that righteousness. It's our position. That righteousness is the currency of heaven. The currency of heaven. And when we talk about glory, glory, we rejoice in the hope of the glory. You know, when we're going to experience God's righteousness, when, the, when we meet the Lord in the air, we are going to experience a righteousness that that's going to be unfathomable. We're going to experience something that is just, just mind-blowing as we meet the Lord in the air. And we have a home eternal in the heavens. The righteous heaven can be, can be yours if you are trusting the Savior. It is guaranteed. It also means that for us who are, trust, who are trusting Christ, it enables us to think things above. That's where our minds ought to be. We ought to be thinking things above. That's the righteous thinking. Colossians chapter 3 talked about. We have a hope. We have a hope of glory that it changes our daily perspective on things. It gives us a different perspective on life. And we boast, not about, not gloating about self, but we boast or rejoice in what God has given us. Peace, grace, hope through the, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And that's what we're celebrating today. We're going to be celebrating with the bread and the cup that we are the justified haves. We who are justified have all that God wants us to have in Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what we have in Christ. I thank you for the security that that brings. I thank you that it glorifies you because of what you have done through Christ. And I thank you, Father, that we can take a moment here today and to celebrate, to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God of being justified by faith. Thank you.